Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to begin by thanking the chairwoman of the full committee, Mrs. Granger, for her leadership and her tireless efforts to bring these appropriation bills to the floor. I also want to thank the ranking member of the subcommittee, my good friend, Mr. Cuellar, who has worked with us in good faith on the bill, despite some disagreements on policy. And lastly, I have enjoyed my time sitting next to the ranking member of the full committee, the gentlelady from Connecticut, not once, but twice in the last few days. The bill before us today provides $62.8 billion for the Department of Homeland Security, an increase of $2.1 billion above the uh, fiscal year 2023 level. In addition, the bill also includes $20.3 billion for the disaster response and recovery activities, including to support communities after the devastating wildfires in Maui and Hurricane Idalia. One of the most pressing challenges this country faces is a border security crisis that has raged under the Biden administration. Two million migrants illegally crossed the border each of the last two years, and we're on track for that same amount this year. Just yesterday alone, there were 11,000 migrant encounters. Let me repeat that. Nearly 11,000 migrant encounters in one day. Regardless of your definition of border security, it's clear that the policies of this administration are not working. The reason is obvious. The White House is sending a message to cartels and migrants that the border is open and there will be no con consequences if you cross illegally. This bill forces the Biden administration to do what it has not and will not do on its own, act to address the border security crisis. The funding and policy provisions included in this bill are in lockstep with the provisions of H.R. 2, which together will put us on a path to securing the border. Unlike recent Homeland Security appropriation bills and the President's request, this bill returns to a tried and true border security approach by investing in methods to both secure the border and deter those who have no legitimate basis for entry. This bill includes $2.1 billion for physical barriers with explicit conditions that the funds be put on contract quickly. The Chief of the Border Patrol and other border security professionals have confirmed time and time again that walls work. The board also provides nearly $500 million to hire more Border Patrol agents to reach an end strength of 22,000 agents. The bill increases funding levels for border security technology so our agents and officers have the latest, most effective equipment to detect and deter illegal activity. Stopping fentanyl and other narcotics that have been ravaging our communities is a priority for all of us. So this bill provides $305 million for non-intrusive inspection equipment at our nation's ports of entry. Detention is a deterrent to those who seek to abuse our immigration system and falsely claim asylum. As a result, the bill provides funding for 41,500 detention beds, which is 16,500 more than this administration requested to ensure that ICE has adequate capacity to detain those with final removal orders or who pose a risk to public safety as well as migrants who illegally cross our borders. To counter the growing strength of Chinese influence in the Indo-Pacific, the bill provides an additional $335 million to the Coast Guard for fast response cutters. And to increase our presence in the Arctic, the bill provides funds for the Coast Guard to acquire a commercially available icebreaker to extend U.S. sovereignty and counter Chinese and Russian expansion into the polar regions. Simply put, the bill before us today ensures that the men and women of the Department of Homeland Security, who work tirelessly on our behalf, have the resources and the tools that they need to protect this great nation. Mr. Chair, I urge my colleagues to support this bill, and I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves. For what purpose does the gentleman from Texas rise? Speaker of the bill, Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker. The gentleman is recognized. First of all, uh, I yield myself as much time as I may uh, consume. First of all, I also want to thank uh, Chairwoman Kate uh, Ranger. Uh, I certainly want to thank uh, Ranking Member DeLauro for working together as much as possible. And I certainly want to thank uh, Chairman David Joyce. Uh, I know we have some disagreements, but at the end uh, of this process, we're going to be working together, uh, making sure that the Homeland Security Bill passes in a bipartisan way. Members, you know, this uh, Democrats and Republicans had a deal when we passed a debt uh, bill uh, some months ago. Uh, now we have our colleagues, uh, the House Republicans, are backing away from this deal 
uh, and yielding to some extreme demands uh, that will not help border security. And now the House remains in chaos as the Republicans have the infighting uh, that will all but guarantee a government shutdown at the hands of the far right in just a few days. Instead of working on a bipartisan continued resolution that will keep the government open, one that will pass both chambers uh, and sign into law, we're here talking about bills uh, that are not going to go very far in the Senate. Uh, so again, uh, I want to make sure that people understand that we want to work together. We want to make this a bipartisan uh, bill uh, to get it done. As the ranking member of the uh, Homeland Appropriations and as a member that actually lives on the border, I'm very concerned about ensuring that the border is secure and that the department has the resources it needs to do that successfully. But instead, what are we doing? If we have a shutdown, we're going to have over 226 uh, folks that uh, employees from the Department of Homeland, they're going to continue to work for a period of time and not get paid. And again, that is not the way to create uh, morale for our Border Patrol and other agents that we have uh, down there at the border. I strongly support the hiring of additional agents, but if there's a shutdown, what's going to happen is that this will prevent us from onboarding the anticipated 150 additional agents in October. Uh, it would also stop the recruitment and the vetting efforts uh, that impact CBP ability to onboard additional agents later on. We cannot have a shutdown, and we got to make sure that we work together to prevent the shutdown itself. Now, if you look at the uh, bill itself, the uh, proposed bill, let's look at, uh, at a couple things. Yes, we did have some bipartisan uh, investments and oversight requirements that we work together, but there are certain funding decisions and policy riders that I cannot support at this moment. Uh, we have to understand the border. Uh, some of my uh, colleagues don't understand the border and they call it a war zone. I would tell you that if you look at the criminal records or the criminal uh, figures that we have, whether it's murder, rape, assault, the border is actually safer than so many other parts of the uh, country. In fact, Washington, D.C. is about two or three times more dangerous if you want to look at those figures than the border community. Now, when it comes to migration issues, yes, we do have a problem and we do need to address it. But I think we need to stop playing defense on the one yard line, which is the, uh, the uh, U.S.-Mexico border. What we need to do is extend the perimeter where we can work with uh, partners like Mexico, Central America, uh, South America uh, countries to make sure that we provide uh, that perimeter and stop folks before they uh, come over to, uh, to our border itself. Uh, this bill has some very outdated strategies, and one of them I know that doesn't work, and I'll call that uh, the uh, uh, 14th century solution to a 21st uh, century problem, uh, which is the border wall. We're spending 2.1 uh, billion, or we intend to spend $2.1 billion on a wall that really doesn't stop. If I can show you uh, uh, some of the figures, let me explain why. Uh, I have some of the, uh, if you look at the border wall, you will see that the fence is in many parts of the, uh, of the uh, border itself. But if you see the heat maps where people are coming into the border, it's usually where the border fence is at. If I can show South Texas as an example itself, you will see that on the South Texas you have a fence. And if you see the heat map, we have a fence here, we have a fence here, we have a fence here, we have a fence there, we have a fence there, and so on. But the activity is where the fence is at. Let me explain why. If you look at the fence, we have a river. The middle of the river is actually the U.S. boundary. Uh, with Mexico. We don't have a fence there. If you look at the riverbanks, we don't have a fence there also uh, because it's going to get washed away. So what we do is we actually put a fence about a quarter of a mile or sometimes even a half a mile away. And what happens, you see the fence here, the, the one in the red itself, and then you see the river over here. So instead of having a fence over here, it's actually put a quarter mile or a mile away so therefore, what, what happens when you have this situation? Well, first of all, if you're asking for asylum, like most people are asking, uh, you, you are going to see people that will touch the riverbank, 
they walked half a mile or half a, a quarter of a mile to the fence over here and asked for asylum. So does the fence stop them? No, it doesn't. And if you ask all these landowners, you're seeding away thousands and thousands and thousands of acres of good farming land, good ranching land away because you put the border and the rivers over here. So again, if you want to stop drugs, we need to put more money. I know we added some money for technology, but we got to add the money at the ports of entry where 90 to 94 percent of the meth, the fentanyl, the cocaine are coming in instead of uh, through this particular area. So again, uh, yeah, this uh, bill also has no funding for USCIS that will help reduce the backlog of uh, the migration. So the people that have been waiting for a while, we're not putting any resources for the USCIS, and we got to make sure that we help uh, the folks who are trying to come in the legal uh, way itself. We do lose a lot of opportunities. We can do a lot more uh, to add monies uh, to counter the, uh, the, uh, the fentanyl and the opioids. And again, most drugs will come in through the ports of entry, and that's where we need to put the focus. And finally, also, we should have an updated border security improvement plan. So again, I certainly want to work with uh, my good friend, uh, Mr. Uh, Joyce. We are going to be together later on in the process. I know we got some disagreements, but we'll get there. And with that, I hope that we have a good bipartisan bill at the end of the process. And with that, I will reserve the balance of my time, Mr. Speaker. Gentleman from Texas Reserves. Gentleman from Ohio is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield uh, to the distinguished gentlewoman from Iowa, a member of our Appropriations Committee, Mrs. Henson, two minutes. Uh, Gentlelady is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Speaker, for yielding. Uh, I rise in support of the fiscal year 24 Homeland Security Appropriations Bill that will help to secure our border. Since President Biden took office, there have been over 6 million illegal immigrant encounters at our southern border. And because of President Biden's open border policies, we have seen countless illegal immigrants, including known people on the terror watch list, violent gang members, and sex offenders released into the homeland. Land. So with this bill, we're finally doing what President Biden won't. We are securing our border. My colleagues and I have been to the border, something the president hasn't bothered to do. We've spoken with law enforcement on the front lines. These brave men and women told us directly that this administration has undercut them at every turn and that they needed more resources to deter illegal immigration rather than incentivize it. While their pleas seem to have fallen on deaf ears at the White House, we here as House Republicans have heard them loud and clear. And in this bill, we deliver for them and for every state that as a result of these policies has become a border state. We are restoring border security technology funding to its highest level. We are funding the 22,000 Border Patrol agents that CBP requested. And we are finally restarting border wall construction instead of letting those materials that taxpayers paid for rust away on the side of the road. We're fully funding ICE detention capacity as a deterrent, and we are providing funding to deport illegal immigrants. Our southern border is a lawless free-for-all under the Biden administration, undermining the safety and security of Iowans and every American. This bill delivers on our promise to secure the border and keep America safe. So let's shut down our border and let's keep our government open and move this bill forward. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield back my time. Gentleman reserves. Yeah, yes, sir. Mr. Gentleman, Speaker. Gentleman from, from Gentleman Ohio, reserves. Ohio reserves. Gentleman from Texas is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I yield one minute to the gentleman from New York, the distinguished Democratic leader, Mr. Jeffries. Gentleman from New York is recognized. Friend, the distinguished uh, gentleman from the great state of Texas in the all-American city of Laredo for yielding and for uh, his continued leadership. I also have great respect for uh, the distinguished gentleman from Ohio, the chair of the subcommittee, and of course the top Democrat uh, on the Appropriations Committee from Connecticut. At the beginning of this Congress, House Democrats made it clear that we are willing ready and able to find common ground with the other side of the aisle, our Republican colleagues, whenever and wherever possible, to make progress for everyday Americans, to build a healthy economy, to address cost of living issues that 
consume the American people, that we were sent to Washington to work on, that President Biden has made progress on with House and Senate Democrats, but of course there's still more work to be done. From the beginning of this Congress, House Democrats have made clear we are ready, willing, and able to find common ground with the other side of the aisle to make progress for the American people. But we've also made clear that we're going to fight extremism whenever necessary. And we are headed toward an extreme MAGA Republican government shutdown in just a few days. Now we can avoid it because there's a bipartisan bill that is working its way through the Senate right now that will continue to fund the government in a way that makes sense for the American people, that would provide funding at the fiscal 2023 levels for six weeks, beginning on October 1st, to give us time for the appropriations process to run its course, to find an agreement, to fund the government in a bipartisan way. It's a continuing resolution, right now pending before the Senate, strongly bipartisan, that doesn't contain any of the extreme policy poison pill riders that House Republicans have been trying to jam down the throats of the American people, but have no part in any bipartisan agreement, particularly when we are faced with a possible government shutdown that will hurt the American people. And it's a continuing resolution that also meets the needs of everyday Americans by providing robust funding for the Americans who've been adversely impacted by extreme weather events all across America, in blue states and in red states, because extreme weather events aren't partisan in nature, and we should be there for the people of Florida and California and Hawaii and Vermont and the Northeast and the Midwest and the Deep South, everyday Americans who've been impacted by extreme weather events. That's what the bipartisan continuing resolution pending in the Senate will do, and it will allow the Ukrainian people to continue their brave, valiant, and courageous effort to push back against illegal, Russian, brutal, violent aggression. So we have a bipartisan continuing resolution working its way through the Senate that meets the needs of the American people, that has input from those of us in this chamber, and that will pass if it reached the floor of this chamber, that would avoid an extreme MAGA Republican shutdown. Just yesterday, a bipartisan group in the Senate voted, I believe, 77 to 19 to advance this bipartisan continuing resolution. It will reach the floor of the House in a few days. And the question is, what will the House Republican majority do? There are only two paths forward. Allow that bipartisan continuing resolution that meets the needs of the American people to receive an up or down vote and it will pass, and we will avoid a shutdown, or refuse to allow that bill to receive an up or down vote, and stick the American people with an extreme MAGA Republican government shutdown that will hurt children, hurt families, hurt seniors, hurt veterans, hurt everyday Americans, and hurt the economy. And if we find ourselves dealing with an extreme MAGA Republican shutdown, what will it all be for? Well, this week is very revealing because we're considering bills, including the one that is before us right now, that have zero chance of becoming law. Zero chance. And they're filled with extreme policy poison pills relating to things like cutting Social Security, criminalizing abortion care, slashing public school funding, taking food out of the mouths of women, infants, and children, hurting the ability of veterans and seniors to meet and make ends meet. That's why the government will shut down, because extreme MAGA Republicans have determined that you want to try to jam 
your right-wing ideology down the throats of the American people, and if we don't pay that ransom note, you want to shut the government down. We know this playbook because we've seen it over and over and over and over again. We saw it in the 1990s under Newt Gingrich when the House Republican majority at the time shut the government down twice, demanding that we slash and burn Medicaid. Well, that government shutdown ended with an unconditional surrender because the American people were unwilling to pay that ransom note to slash and burn Medicaid. So the same thing happened in 2013 when the Tea Party forced a reluctant John Boehner to shut the government down for 14 days. What was the extreme ransom note demand at the time? That President Obama should repeal the Affordable Care Act, his signature legislative accomplishment. It ended the same way in unconditional surrender because the American people were unwilling to pay the extreme ransom note. And then again in 2018 into 2019, another government shutdown, longest in American history, 35 days. What was the extreme ransom note demand at the time? That the American taxpayer be forced to pay billions and billions of dollars to fund a medieval, ineffective border wall that Donald Trump wanted to make happen. And that government shutdown ended exactly the same way after 35 days. Unconditional surrender because the American people were unwilling to pay that extreme ransom note. So why are we going through this exercise again when we know it's going to end the same way? Because the American people are not willing, not willing to pay a ransom note that will allow my extreme Republican colleagues to criminalize abortion care or to cut Social Security or to slash public school funding or to take food out of the mouths of women or infants or children. That's not a ransom note that will ever be paid. And you have a bipartisan vehicle coming out of the Senate that will be before the House in a few days. And there's only one responsible course of action. House Democrats are prepared to support that bipartisan agreement so we can avoid a government shutdown that will hurt the American people. And the only question is, will our Republican colleagues join us? I yield back. Gentleman from Texas Reserves. I do reserve. Thank you. Balance the Thank you. Uh, gentleman from Ohio is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield to the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Collins, three minutes. Gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Joyce, for yielding. And Mr. Speaker, you know, as a member of Congress, our job description up here is real short. It's take care of your constituency and it's have oversight of the federal government. And we do that through things called appropriations and hearings. Appropriations is what we're working on right now. Well, I want to tell you, the past nine months, I've been out here crossing this country attending field hearings. I've also been speaking with and listening to members of our industries about the overreach and the out-of-control government agencies that we have up here. And that's why I rise today. I rise today to speak about an important issue that, uh, that sadly this bill is going to fail to address. You see, the, uh, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's boat speed limiter proposed rule, which, by the way, NOAA is an unauthorized federal agency, never authorized by Congress. But NOAA's rule limits the speed now of all boats 35 feet and longer to 10 knots. And this is up and, uh, up and down the, almost the entire eastern seaboard. Now, they're doing this to, uh, in claims that this rule is necessary to, uh, to save the North Atlantic whale, which by uh, what I've been able to find, that they've been able to maintain this roughly the same population since, uh, since the 1980s. 
So I just wanted to go over a few quick facts. Now approximately 15 of these whales have been killed by boats in the last 18 years. Now there is approximately 63,000 registered boats in this 35 to 65 foot length. Y'all, that's a one in a million in a million chances that you're gonna hit one of these whales. And if you do, you're gonna come out on the short end of the stick and they're gonna know it. But this is what's gonna happen. This is gonna have an $84 billion economic impact just on the West Coast. 340,000 jobs will be impacted and that's also on the East Coast. You see, this rule, it's not just gonna cripple the boating and sport fishing industry. It's gonna crush it. And it's also gonna crush and kill the communities that support them. Now, I offered an amendment to, uh, to prohibit the Coast Guard from enforcing this rule. Because, you know, I think our Coast Guard's got a whole lot more important things to be out there doing. But, uh, but sadly, my, uh, my amendment was not made in order. And so, therefore, Mr. Speaker, I stand today and I, and I urge my colleagues to fight, to fight for language that's going to prevent the Coast Guard from enforcing this misguided rule during our conference committee. I thank you, and I yield back. Gentleman, yes, from, gentleman from Ohio Reserves? Yes. Gentleman from Texas is recognized. Mr. Chair, I yield four minutes to the gentlewoman from Connecticut, the distinguished ranking member of the Appropriations Committee, Ms. DeLauro. Gentleladies recognized. The Homeland Security Appropriations Bill before us weakens our national security, defunds border security, harms the Homeland Security workforce, and leaves Americans vulnerable to escalating disasters. That we are debating this bill on September 27, three days before the end of the fiscal year, when House Republicans have provided no path forward to keep our government open is irresponsible. The House majorities exhibited their own inability and unwillingness to govern by ensuring this bill cannot become law without other partisan legislation moving first. But it cannot become law. Rather than voting to keep our government open and ensuring border protection officers and immigration officials get paid, Republicans are pursuing a path explicitly designed to shut down the federal government. A shutdown will have consequences for every American family and on the border and border communities. Mr. Speaker, Democrats do not support an open border, but let me be unequivocal. There is a crisis on our southern border. Our border communities are struggling with the influx of immigration. The status quo cannot be maintained. That much we agree on. Where the majority minority differs is how we address this issue. We must continue to invest in our processing facilities and in transportation and medical care. We need to have an effective process of determining who is eligible to enter the country and who is not. And we must continue to invest in newer technology and in our immigration and border security officials and invest in immigration judges. But we must also think bigger, broader, bolder. We cannot hope to resolve this issue if we only begin addressing it right at the border. We must invest in our partnerships with Latin American countries and fund the expansion of safe mobility offices. Our Republican colleagues refuse to negotiate with Democrats on these issues. We were kept on the sidelines. And thus, this bill does not make the sound investments that would actually reduce the burden on our border facilities and our communities. This bill misses important opportunities to address the dire opioid crisis that we face as a nation. It provides insufficient funding for our ports of entry, where the vast majority of these drugs enter our country. We should be focusing resources where we agree they are needed most, like combating fentanyl crossing the border, helping our border communities, advancing our cybersecurity posture, protecting Americans from violent extremism and foreign adversaries. I'm also deeply concerned about the conditions that greet migrants and asylum seekers, people who leave their homes out of desperation and necessity. We have a responsibility 
to ensure the safety of these migrants, especially children, and to provide resources so that, they, that those who are entitled to stay under our immigration laws can do so. Please understand, by law, the United States is required to take in unaccompanied children from, non, from neighboring countries, screen them, house them, and provide safe placement. This bill leaves Americans vulnerable to the growing number and increasing severity of natural disasters, exposes Americans to foreign threats with inadequate cyber and infrastructure security investments, and does not fully fund the Transportation Security Agency personnel. House Republicans claim to care about oversight, but this bill proposes several cuts to programs throughout the Department of Homeland Security, which are critical to the oversight of our immigration facilities. This bill also eliminates discretionary funding for refugee processing. It shifts the burden of those costs to an already backlogged and overwhelmed system. We all know the General enactment. Lady, General Lady's time expired. Seconds. Gentleman from Texas. Uh, I'll go ahead ten and extend for an extra one minute. No, 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 10 seconds is all I need. We all know the enactment of appropriations will require bipartisan agreement on sound investments, not reckless cuts and partisan policy riders. Let us focus. Let us focus on, re on opening the government, keeping it open. There is a bipartisan bill in the Senate that we're now debating. 77 to 19, that's overwhelmingly bipartisan. It will come here. Let's put that bill up, get bipartisan support on this floor. General, it's time expired. Bring these harmful consequences to Texas. the American people to a close. General, Don't close the government down. I yield back. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'll uh, reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman from Texas Reserves. Gentleman from Ohio is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield to the friend and gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Muser, for two minutes. Gentlemen's re recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank Chairman Joyce, my good friend, colleague uh, from Ohio, very, very much. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I do rise in support of the Homeland Appropriations Bill. We all know that our country, our citizens, are in dire need of a stronger homeland security. We know that we have an unmitigated, unmitigated, Mr. Speaker, disaster at our borders. Three years ago, Mr. Speaker, we also all know that our borders were in fact secure. Today, almost 10,000 illegals in despair are crossing our, our border, not including the so-called gotaways. Human trafficking, deadly drugs, are killing, uh, are killing our, our Americans, primarily our young people, by the tens of thousands. This bill adds to our Customs and Border Patrol, Mr. Speaker, provides for border barriers, which work, and for fentanyl detection, strengthens our asylum laws, and forces Secretary Mayorkas to do his job. It also, Mr. Speaker, ceases the ability for HHS through the DHS funding to send ghost flights into my district in the middle of the night. That can't happen anymore on, under this bill. This bill also provides for our Coast Guard and eliminates $500 million, over $500 million, in Go Green initiatives that have absolutely nothing to do with homeland security, Mr. Speaker. This bill is a vote for our nation's homeland security. A no vote? Well, is a vote for the status quo. And Mr. Speaker, by the way, if we want to keep our government open, we, we have a plan. We have a plan to keep our government open, and it includes border security and reasonable fiscal sanity with some moderate spending reductions within our discretionary spending. If we have, we, we unfortunately have a handful of Republicans on our side not supporting it, but every single Democrat does not support securing our border and moderate reductions to our outrageous spending that's taken place. Gentlemen's time has expired. For the record, Thank you. I yield back. Gentleman from Ohio, reserves? Gentleman from Texas is recognized. Mr. Chair, I yield one and a half minutes to the gentleman from Maryland and the member of the Appropriations Committee, Mr. Throne. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And thank you to the gentleman from Texas. Here we are, three days from a government shutdown, voting again 
on extreme Republican-led bills that do nothing, nothing to prevent it. The ink wasn't even dry on the bipartisan debt ceiling bill deal before Republican leadership, leadership, not leadership, reneged on their word, reneged on their promise. Instead, the bills we're considering this week include disastrous funding cuts and culture war priorities, priorities that apparently play well in fundraising emails, but fail to address our nation's problems, like the opioid crisis. This Department of Homeland Security Appropriations Bill would dedicate $2 billion in taxpayer money to build a border wall, a sixth century solution to a 21st century problem especially considering 90% of the fentanyl comes through the border at legal points of entry driven by American citizens. As a member of this subcommittee, I find this unbelievable. Across the board, Republicans' funding bill undercuts our ability to take care of America today and build a brighter future to our children and grandchildren. It's about time the Republicans put the needs of the majority over the loud few and pass a government funding bill that meets America's needs. Campaign season's over. Ten seconds. Fifteen seconds. Campaign season's over. It's time to govern. I urge my colleagues to reject this hyperpartisan bill and pass the bipartisan Senate bill. I yield back. Mr. Chair, I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman from Texas Reserves. Gentleman from Ohio is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Speaker. I reserve. Gentleman reserves. Gentleman from Texas is recognized. Uh, Mr. Chair, I yield one minute to the uh, gentlewoman from Illinois, Ms. Ramirez. Gentlelady is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As a proud daughter of immigrants, the wife of a dreamer, the representative of a district proud of its immigrants and how they contribute to our economy, I am disgusted with the Republicans' relentless persecution and scapegoating of immigrants. While we should be looking for ways forward to keep providing essential service for our districts, Republicans want to play games with lives and livelihoods through their inability to lead. They're repeating false claims that the border is open and conditioning government funding on dangerous and irresponsible requests that will neither make the border more secure or protect our securities. There's a dissonance between this. This party of fiscal responsibility is driving us to a shutdown, while immigrants, supposedly our economic downfall, are contributing more than $20.4 billion in taxes just in Illinois and with 11 million more immigrants ready to boost our economy through needed pathways to work. It's time to leave the political theater. People are tired of it. Let's recognize the positive fiscal contributions of immigrants let's, to our nation, and let's do the work General our ladies, time's expired. send us to do. Gentleman from Texas. Mr. Chair, I reserve the balance of Gentleman my time. Gentleman from Texas reserves. Gentleman from Ohio is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield to the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Grothman, one minute. Gentleman is recognized. Yeah, I just want to comment a little bit on, on the last speech from the other side. They said the vast majority of fentanyl coming across in this country comes from designated points of entry. And you hear that said. But the reason I think what they should say is the vast amount of fentanyl that we catch comes across from designated point of, points of entry. There are, depending on the month, 30 or 40,000 people who are gotaways who come across between designated points of entry. We never catch them because they're called gotaways, and nobody is monitoring places that are not designated points of entry. So clearly, if you want to sneak fentanyl across the border, you would do it between designated points of entry, and it would not show up on any statistics because we don't catch those people. Thank you. Gentleman from Ohio Reserves. We'll reserve. Thank Gentleman you. from Ohio Reserves. Gentleman from Texas is recognized. Mr. Chair, I yield one minute to the gentlewoman from Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee. General ladies is recognized. Let me thank the gentleman. And um, again, I said that I would come to the floor and each time would say that I do not want a government shutdown. I don't want the American people to suffer. 
and I want the government to be able to function. Uh, as an almost 20-year member of the Authorizing Committee of Homeland Security, uh, I am stunned at the lack of concern uh, that my friends on the other side of the aisle would have on a government shutdown on Homeland Security. Uh, these are extensive government employees, many of them represented by the American Federation of Government Employees. TSOs, of course, would continue to work in the Transportation Administration, but so many would be working without compensation. If we're concerned about the border, I don't know why the Southwest Border Initiative is out, why money for USCIS is eliminated, why opportunities for shelter services are eliminated, particularly when we realize that throngs of people are coming here uh, that are having the ability to apply for asylum. And ask the gentleman Time's expired. Yes, uh, an additional 30 seconds. General ladies recognized. So the answer to this, of course, is to give ourselves more time to address uh, the question of serving the American people. So I rise, as the leader did, to support the bipartisan Senate continuing resolution, which maintains current funding, takes care of communities impacted by natural disasters, and provides funding to Ukraine, and contains no poison pills. If we're serious about doing the job of keeping this government open, supporting the hardworking uh, American workers, then we will support the Senate continuing resolution. We'll do it tomorrow General Lady's time has expired and save this nation do not shut down gentleman from Texas gentleman from Texas reserve Mr. chair I reserve the balance of my time gentleman from Texas reserve gentleman from Ohio is recognized uh, I reserve balance of my time gentleman gentleman reserves gentleman from Texas uh, is recognized Mr. chair I'm prepared to close that we have no further speakers gentleman is recognized Mr. Chair, and, and to my good colleague, uh, Mr. Joyce, look, we are apart right now. I know we're going to get together, but I do want to remind uh, some of our colleagues that, um, you know, well, we had an opportunity on the current bill that we have right now. We added the last couple of years $2.4 billion. That's a 15% increase for Border Patrol agents, uh, pay increases, add more Border Patrol agents, uh, ICE, uh, CBP, the other folks in. We had the monies uh, to, to do that, but at the end of the day, and if, I'll just take one example, we gave money to, uh, to Homeland, 15% increase, yet there's only two members, when well, we all vote, on the Republican side that actually supported the, uh, the appropriations bill, Homeland. So if we care so much about Homeland, why did we vote no on the final appropriations bill. I know some of us are going to vote no, and I'm voting no on this one, but on the final one, I will support the final appropriations bill. The other thing is, as the leader said, uh, Mr. Uh, Jeffrey, the Democrat leader said, look, we, we have three days to work this out, and by passing this bill uh, to, to the Senate, it's not going to get there. I would just like to remind members that we ought to be working on preventing the shutdowns. And if you look at the shutdowns that we've had, uh, and, uh, since the 1990s. In 1995, uh, it was a House Republican that, uh, that had a five-day uh, shutdown. Uh, on these, on, uh, that was November 13, 1995. On December 15, 1995, it was another Republican-led uh, House with 21 days of a shutdown. And then on September 30th, 2013, again, for 16 days, it was a House Republican-led that uh, allowed the shutdown. Then on January 19, 2018, another House Republican uh, uh, led House, and it was a shutdown for two days. And then on December 21, 2018, uh, it was another House Republican shutdown for 34 days. So again, I hope that on Thursday, I mean on Saturday or on Sunday at 12.01, it is not another Republican led shutdown. So we're asking you, Please give us input. Let's sit down. Let's talk about it. And I know, Ms. Joyce, I have a lot of respect for you and your staff. I know we can do this together. Uh, we're, we're, we'll be uh, voting no on this.
but I know that at the end of this process, we'll be uh, voting together on this, on a yes bill. So thank you so much. Uh, with that, uh, Mr. Chair, I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields. Gentleman from Ohio is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I thought we were here to talk about the Homeland uh, Security Appropriations Bill, uh, but and, and I look forward to having further discussion and reviewing these amendments, and I yield back. 